So, the conclusion is that there are multiple sources of beauty. And we probably have multiple responses to beauty in our brain. We don't know all of it. The brain probably has different ways of responding to scenery, to art, to faces, to ideas. Ideas can be beautiful. Why do people think that Einstein's uh, relativity uh, formula, E equals MC squared, why do people think it's beautiful? Because it's elegant. So we also think that some ideas are beautiful. So we may have many different ways of responding to different kinds of beauty. So how does this happen in our brain? How does it happen that we, th that we think that, some, that something is beautiful? And so we say that beauty is an emergent property, that beauty is not purposefully put into the art by the artist. It's not like an object. Or into sunset clouds, or fields of flowers, or waterfalls. No one puts it there. We, we, our brain makes it beautiful. Beauty is derived from neural computations in the brain of the observer. And that's how come sometimes there are differences of opinion. That's how come we sometimes think that beauty is subjective, that it reflects the brain of the person who does the computation. Now, the thing about beauty is that attraction through beauty is very, very, very powerful. Let's discuss the special case of faces. That's the easiest to talk about when it comes to beauty. Look at this face. This face is used to sell face cream. Why do they put this beautiful face with face cream. Look at this face. This face is used to tell you that if you eat this lollipop, you lose weight. But they use a beautiful face to attract your attention. Look at this face. This face is used to sell you yogurt. But they use a beautiful face because they know that you will be attracted to the message. And look at this face. This face is used to attract your attention and desire to smoke. Now, is smoking good for you? It's not good for you. It's bad. But the way that they sell the product of cigarettes is by putting a beautiful face with the product because they'll attract your attention. And you'll want to do the same thing that someone with a beautiful face does. Let's consider the faces of babies. Why do we think that babies are cute? Why do parents of babies think that their babies are the most beautiful babies in the whole world? Why is it that they take pictures of their babies and they send it to everyone all over the world? And the reason is biological. Because we have to take care of them. And babies are a lot of work. It's a lot of work. They cry in the middle of the night. They have to be fed all the time. They can't do this and they can't do that. So. Parents have to think that the babies are beautiful. And again, it's the, it's the attraction, it's beauty. Again, attracting the desire to take care of the baby. Now, after the baby grows up and becomes 20 years old, and the parents look at the album that they made when the baby was born, the parents think, oh, how could we have thought this baby is so beautiful? I mean, you know, because it's already 20, but this happens to everyone, and probably will happen to you too. And you kind of feel silly a little bit that you took all these pictures and you sent it to all the relatives. Because at that time, you really did think that they were the most beautiful. And furthermore, 
And furthermore, the beauty is related to another thing. It's related to the secretion of the hormone oxytocin. See, oxytocin? So it helps us to get attached to the baby, the beauty that we think of the, that the baby is beautiful. And a hormone of oxytocin is produced to, to bind it together so we'll take care of the baby who cries in the middle of the night, who needs to eat all the time and needs to be changed all the time, and all of this thing. See, so again, you see how beauty is part of our uh, biological existence. What do we know about beauty from looking at patients who have had brain damage? It's very important. We have to learn from neuropsychology. We, we need to get to understand uh, the nature of beauty by seeing what happens after someone has brain damage. What happens to their reactions to beauty, a beauty reactions? Well, it turns out that beauty-related reactions do not disappear following brain damage. They do not disappear regardless of the damage location. It doesn't matter where the damage is, the patient will still have beauty reactions to things around them. Whether the damage is here or here or here, or here it doesn't matter. They still can react with uh, feelings of beauty towards something that they see or they hear. So this is an important lesson. It teaches us that beauty reactions can take place in many places in the brain and you cannot obliterate them. Unlike language, for instance. If someone has damage right here in Broca's area, in the left side, they can talk. But it's not like that with beauty reactions. What about artists with brain damage? What happens to them? Can they produce works of beauty? Someone who had a right hemisphere stroke. His name was Lovis Corinth. He was um, a German uh, artist. So these are self-portraits that he made of himself when he looked in the mirror. See, this is what he produced before. You can see his talent, right? Very talented person. Is, uh, it's his facial expressions. And this is what he produced afterwards. Is this less artistic looking, less aesthetic looking than the previous one that he did before the stroke? And the answer is no, because he continued to produce works of beauty afterwards. What did we learn about the nature of beauty from brain damage in established artists? We learned that after damage, works of beauty can be produced. And it doesn't matter where the damage is in the brain. Neither brain hemisphere alone controls art production. So if there is damage in the left hemisphere, artists can go on producing work. If the damage is in the right hemisphere, they go on producing work. No specific focal region or neural pathway in the brain controls art production. This is what we've learned by looking at artists who've had focal damage for many different reasons, stroke or tumor. What about brain and pleasure? What about that? Pleasure can be derived from multiple sources, just like beauty can be derived from multiple sources, can be derived from multiple sources. Is the pleasure derived from art unique? Is it a special kind of pleasure or is it different? So this is a question that we have to ask. And this is what the scholars in the field who are studying this are asking themselves. Is it a unique pleasure from looking at art? What do you think? You think there is a special, something special, different from all the other pleasures that you have? Not all art gives us pleasure. There's something to consider. We are attracted to art but not necessarily because of pleasure. We are attracted to art because art is a communicative system and it sends messages that we have to interpret. But it's not necessarily because of pleasure itself. Is the pleasure derived from beauty unique? We have to ask, is it unique? If you look at something beautiful, you have a particular kind of a pleasure that's different from all the other pleasures in the world? 
And the answer is we do not yet know the answers. But we are thinking about this because we have to plan experiments to, to figure this out. What do we know so far? Now I'm going to tell you what we already know about uh, pleasure. We know that pleasure, the sensation of pleasure, the sensation of pleasure involves a pathway that's called the reward system. And we first learned about it from animal, animal work, not, not from humans. So again, this is a side view of the middle of the brain and turning it to the side. So this is the front of the brain and this is the back of the brain. Pleasure involves the secretion of a neurotransmitter known as dopamine. Dopamine is a critical component of our sensation of pleasure. And it's something that motivates us. It's part, it, it creates motivations for us. When we have pleasure, then there is a lot of dopamine is secreted and it motivates us to do other things. The dopamine is created in the ventral tegmental area, right here. You see, right here is where it's created. It's called ventral tegmental area. And it goes through a pathway right here that's called the medial forebrain bundle. And then it comes to this nucleus that's called the nucleus accumbens. Nucleus accumbens, right here. The nucleus accumbens sends axons to the frontal lobes. And this is how the dopamine reaches our frontal lobes and controls our behavior. And it's this uh, nucleus, the nucleus accumbens, is involved in all of our addictions. Addiction to smoking, addiction to eating, addiction to drugs, cocaine, marijuana, methamphetamines, all of these things involve the nucleus accumbens because the nucleus accumbens decides how much dopamine to send to, to the frontal lobes. So the question of the people who work on art and brain and pleasure is, is this what happens when we look at art and have pleasure? Is this the same place that's involved when we look at something beautiful and we have a sensation of pleasure? And the answer is, we don't know yet. We, we, we just don't, don't know all the answers, but we have a clue. We know a little bit of where to go, where, where to look. So, let me summarize the main points of this lecture. We have art expression. I have emphasized the visual arts. Many of the things that I said can apply to music and dance as well. But it's easier to talk about visual arts, and so I chose that as the main focus. There are many, many, many different forms of art expressions. Art is a communicative system. It communicates something to the viewer. It's part of the culture that we humans have. Only the human brain can produce art. And the reason it can do it is because the human brain works on the principle of symbolic cognition, symbolic and abstract cognition. Art has a biological origin, and it has to do specifically with the display issue, that artists display their work. Beauty also has a biological origin. Particularly when it comes to, to, attract, to attract the viewer to look at the art, to look at the message in the art, to look at the quality of genes of the artist. Is it a skilled artist? Is he a talented artist? Is he uh, someone who produces good, good art? And all of these things, the attraction and the symbolic cognition together add up to be a powerful communicative system 
that we humans have in our culture. And the question that I raised is that there, are there multiple beauty-related responses in the brain? Do we have different kinds of reactions in the brain to the different types of beauty that we have in our world? You know, faces, nature scenery, uh, our babies, and whatever, whatever we think is beautiful. Do we have different types of responses in the brain? And this is the end of my lecture. Thank you very much.